Um, so now we're going we're gonna to switch gears and start talking about positive stuff and, and what, what can we do? What are some of the management options? I'm going to give you a 5,000 foot elevation look at it because that's all I can do in a, in a venue like this. As John Buckhouse said, out on the ground you can get down in the weeds. So as I'm talking about things and you've got it, things resonate with you, you've got examples on that particular practice or questions, again, let's, let's go ahead and ask those questions as we go along. Um, so grazing land management to enhance water quality. Um, I'm going to talk about riparian. I talked about un, unmanaged or riparian unfriendly grazing before lunch. I'm going to talk a bit about riparian friendly grazing management now after lunch. I'm going to talk about the capacity of rangelands to sequester microbial pollutants. And the, there's a huge capacity in our grazing lands to trap and kill microbes that are in all kinds of fecal sources. And so the, understanding that helps us understand how BMPs can be effective. Things like filter strips, um, things like that. And then just kind of wrap up and talk about the water quality protection toolbox. I'll also talk a bit about irrigated pasture uh, grazed and uh, irrigated pasture management. Um, there is some irrigated pasture in Washington I'm learning. Uh, yeah, so that's good. We have, we have about 800,000 acres of irrigated pasture in California and it's essential for us in our, in our statewide cow, maintaining our statewide cow-calf herd. Um, so, and so kind of thinking about the line of research that, that we've been going down in our group and a lot of others, I, uh, there's this, you know, the pollutants of concern and this whole box up here, you know, the nutrients, the microbes, the sediments, there's background levels background sources, there's livestock sources for these various things. I talked quite a bit in the first talk about this box and the research that we've been doing on that. And, you know, again, talking about, we know these guys have got it. How much is coming out of them, you know, into the process of getting transported, surviving, escaping management solutions like BMPs, and eventually affecting water quality conditions out there across the landscape. It's kind of how we think about this line. You know, and the capacity of the, the natural inherent pollutant transport environmental fate dynamics and how management can impair, you know, the capacity of the environment to be a fate, be a sink. I talked about, for instance, how we can affect riparian function and health as an example. So I'm going to talk more about how we can enhance it. So this, talk about this, and talk about management solutions as they relate to water quality conditions that we see out there. That's kind of how we've been, in our group, been thinking about the research that we do and how it's organized. Um, and so riparian friendly grazing management. Um, and so I, I use this, this image a lot. So this is, these, are the, these are reaches of the same stream. They're about a half mile apart. They're under different ownership and different management style. Um, both of these are grazed by cattle. The grazing strategy here um, is as a riparian pasture and the family that owns it up in the hills, they've got a, a forest service allotment. They'll come into this a couple, two to three weeks early in the summer, graze it on their way up to their um, forest service allotment, be off of it all of the summer. As they come off the forest service in September, October, they'll come back down, spend a couple weeks there, and then take them to wherever they're going to go for the winter. And so that's how they've integrated that into their overall grazing strategy as, as a riparian pasture to give you one example of what, what can yield some of the attributes that we're looking for in stream bank protection, the types of species, recruitment of willows, all those things that we, we hope to see. And you know, this one down the, down the stream just a little bit, it's, it's basically a very simple management strategy. You put them out there when they arrive in late May, early June, and they take them off when they go home in October. And they're there, it's a great big pasture, the creek runs through it. And, you know, that's, that's the extent of, of the grazing management. And so, you know, not that that grazing strategy will always lead to this outcome, but you can see streams that have very similar, stream reaches that have very similar potential definitely are responding to the grazing strategies that they're faced with differently. Um, and so we see a lot of this kind of variation across rangelands of California. Um, so yeah, I went through this with you, the whole reminding you, the whole unmanaged riparian grazing kind of cascading effect that can occur. I won't belabor that anymore. Just want to give you the, the alternative to that, which is thinking about managed riparian grazing where 
using practices like herding and, and timing intensity and frequency of grazing, actually actively managing can lead to uh, meadows, stream systems that are intact and are providing the functions that we hope to see from them. Stable stream banks, cooler water, more water to be released, released later in the season. Um, they are an active filtration system, do provide habitat, and do affect floodplain and flood attenuation. And so those are all the things that we expect out of streams. And we talk a lot about what's the water quality standard, what's the E. coli standard, those types of things. I think it's important often to think about, and John, you know, John talked a lot about this, if we can achieve these functions, the water quality standard is probably less relevant. It's the fact that we've achieved the hydrologic function that can be achieved there. Our management's in harmony with you know, achieving those beneficial uses and the E. coli outcome is, I think, less of a factor. Um, and so thinking about how to achieve that, you have to set agricultural and riparian enhancement goals. You know, we do these for certain, but if, if in those riparian units that are a special management unit on the ranch, they should be, if we don't have goals to enhance the riparian area, how are we going to achieve them? How are we going to enhance the riparian area? It's just blind luck, right? If you don't set it as a goal, it's not going to occur. And that's a big hurdle, I think, to get past with a landowner or any manager is to make the goal that we all might have for their land one of their goals, too. And, you know, looking for win-wins is the only way to really make that happen, I think. Um, and so then, once we get there, which is 99% of the battle, I would say, um, the rest of it is technical, um, just setting reasonable targets for livestock browse on desired plants and disturbance to stream banks. Do any of you deal with uh, Forest Service or other public lands grazing issues? You guys are aware of, like, the riparian standards and guides that exist on Forest Service allotments, you know? and so. It's pretty common on, on public lands across the western U U.S. to set some annual, annual utilization standards. You know, no more than 40% of the annual herbaceous production along a riparian area to be grazed in a given year. No more than 20% of willows or other aspen or other riparian woodies to be browsed within a given year. No more than 20% of physical hoof bank hoof damage to stream banks, you know, those kinds of tangible targets. I wouldn't suggest that those numbers on public lands are the appropriate targets for grazing on, on private lands, but those are the kinds of things to look to so that you're limiting the utilization. You've got an indicator that you can see with the eye as a manager. Okay, I'm at 30% use. I figure I'm going to get to 40% use in the next week. It's time to start thinking about what I'm going to do next week as opposed to, okay, I'm at 80% use, it doesn't matter, it's too late. And so having some management cues like that, I don't know the perfect number, those are the kinds of things to look for. And I think in the adaptive management framework, you, you start implementing some of those, start managing for some of those, and I think you'll begin to see improvement enhancement in riparian conditions, um, assuming riparian grazing is the primary culprit if you have inadequate willow recruitment if you have inadequate stream bank stability, if you have in, inadequate you know, riparian cover, then those are the kinds of things you want to directly manage for um, on at, a, you know, at an annual basis. Does that make sense? So it's not rocket science. It really isn't. Um, so setting those targets, and then, then it's just a matter of what's the most rational, practical management strategy for that ranch enterprise to achieve those. That's when you, all that flexibility and creativity on the part of the manager can come to be. So having the goal, helping them see and set targets and indicators for use, and then working with them to figure out what makes sense for them. Maybe it's a complete disclosure of the stream. Maybe it's a whole bunch of other things done instead. Maybe it's just a few things that are required. And so I think that's where you start having the conversation with them about, so exactly what role does this riparian pasture play in your plan to keep this cow herd alive 365 days out of the year. And if you can figure that out and then start talking with them about what are some alternatives that exist um, to allow you to get less use on that piece of property, that, that component of the ranch, that's how you enter into a conversation with them that gets you towards a site-specific solution that's logistically feasible for them in their operation. Does that make sense? 
the first question I ask a rancher when I'm invited to look at their riparian area and I see a problem is, so, so what do you use this for? Because that's the first thing I need to know before I can start figuring out how to help them fix it in their operation. Um, and so, you know, prescribed timing, season of grazing to meet these targets, observe, adapt, observe, adapt. You're not going to get there. You're not going to get it perfect the first time. I think, you know, you start trying something new, give it two or three years to work. Don't, every year, don't fidget all over, you know, don't put them on, take them off. I mean, give it, give it a little time. Give these systems a little time to, 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 to respond. Take a 10-year plan on getting a system into a good place, and every two or three years, think about whether you need to make big adaptations. Unless you're seeing clearly in the first year, it's not working, and I need to just start out with something different. Um, but yet, I get that advice a lot to be patient in this process of, of recovery. You didn't get there overnight. You're certainly not going to get out of there overnight. The, the, the key is to, to start down the road. Now I'm starting to sound like John Buckhouse, who's right most of the time. So the toolbox, again, it's the old tools. It's the old tools that we've always had available to us in range management, livestock management on broad, expansive landscapes. Um, prescribed grazing, which is the management of the intensity, the season, fall versus spring, summer, um, the frequency, come on once in the spring and don't come back, come on once in the spring and once in the fall, whatever the case may be. Those are the kinds of options that are available to you. Um, the, um, as well as not just grazing, but rest. I mean, fundamentally we know a couple of things from about 50 years of grazing research. Stocking rate is a primary determinant of vegetation response to grazing management. The other thing we know is rest is a really important component of allowing plant communities to recover, reproduce, conduct the physiological functions, reproduction, carbohydrate storage, root growth, those things that they have to do as a living being to be vigorous and have good vigor. And so we, we have to provide the plant with those opportunities. Um, and prescribed grazing is how we do that. And you can't do prescribed grazing without facilities. You know, if you're going to create an exclusionary fence on a waterway, you've got to provide off-site drinking water. Even if you don't create an exclusionary fence for a water body, and the water body is the only drinking water in a thousand acre pasture, where are the cows going to be? They're going to be at the creek. They have to be. They don't have any choice. They need 20, 30 gallons of water a day, depending on temperature. So you've got to provide off-site water, no matter what. Um, Supplemental feed, where do you put your salt? If you're feeding mineral, if you're feeding crude protein, if you're doing things like that, you can use that as a tool to distribute them. And we're always, we're always feeding animals some kind of supplemental, supplemental feed throughout the course of their, of their annual forage demand. Um, and fencing, fencing is really important infrastructure. It can be hard fence, it can be snow drift fence, it can be, you know, um, uh, topography-based drift fencing, it can be electric fencing. There's all kinds of tools that are available um, when it comes to fencing. We just have to keep in mind that fencing is expensive and um, maybe you want to try things out with some electric fence before you decide where to put a permanent fence. You know, it's pretty easy to string out an electric fence and see if it's going to work or not. Um, it takes time. All of this takes time, energy, and money. Um, and I think that has to be acknowledged um, in this process. And we've got to look for the opportunities for improving riparian grazing management to also at least maintain and perhaps improve the bottom line of the ranch wherever possible. Otherwise, folks aren't going to do it. And so back to that example of you know, a survey of 130 grazed riparian areas that this crazy graduate student of mine pulled off. And again, we went around and looked at all these sites that range from really bad to really good health, quizzed all, as I'd say, interrogated all these ranchers. and got all this information out of them, conducted statistical black magic on it to see how they were correlated. And I talked about these negative correlations earlier. As we increase grazing duration in days per year, we see a, a negative correlation between increasing that and riparian health score. Cattle density, cows, cows or animal units per acre, there was a negative relationship there. And the frequency, basically, you know, more use, more utilization on that riparian area. That's why we talk about annual utilization standards, our targets, because we've got to find a way to recognize 
when we're approaching too much utilization so that we can make a real-time management decision to move those animals and we've got to have the infrastructure to be able to do that. The things that are positively correlated to riparian health, off-stream attractants such as water tanks and supplement, herding, it's the oldest trick in the book when it comes to being a, a, a cowman or, a, or a, a shepherd, the herding to control utilization and time spent in the riparian area, and then just duration of rest that you allow that riparian area to have during the growing season. And what was really interesting, Teresa would ask you know, these, these producers, have you got an off-site stock tank? They all say, yeah, we got one of those. You dig in a little bit, though, and they, they'll let you know, well, you know, half during hunting season is full of bullet holes. And yeah, it's there, but it was mid-season before I fixed the pipe that broke when the freeze. And so it's just, yeah, it's there. They all have one. But when you ask them, and that wasn't statistically significant, yes, no, it wasn't statistically significant to health. You ask them, how many days out of the year do you spend making sure the water tank's got water in it, the supplement's full, and the cows are finding it? As that increases, we see positive correlations. It wasn't yes, no. It was the effort that you put in to making sure that BMP is filling the need that you expect it to. Herding, of course, the same way, and rest period duration. And so effort matters. Time, energy matters as much as the practice itself. Um, so the negative correlations, I'm not going to belabor those. We've talked about those. I don't want to be negative anymore. Um, so thinking about the positive correlations, again, duration from rest, from grazing between bouts. Um, Obviously, resting the entire grazing season definitely benefits the riparian area and, and allows everything to grow, no defoliation. Um, that's not generally feasible, particularly on private ground. So it's just figuring out what's the uppermost use that we can make that allows it to be economically feasible, yet still allows for recovery and maintenance. You know, it's one thing to recover a degraded stream, and it's one thing to maintain a functional stream. Those are different levels of use. And so depending on where that stream is in that degradation pathway is going to affect how much use you can make of it. Where does season off street water, off stream water and supplement? Absolutely. I mean, there's just no doubt. Uh, somebody was mentioning Derek Bailey, who's a prof at, uh, Dean was, uh, we were talking about Derek Bailey, who's a prof at um, New Mexico State University. And he's done a ton of work demonstrating the capacity to move livestock around the landscape based on where you put supplement where you have water, you know, particularly in more arid, larger environments. You know, you, you get arid enough, you can use water alone to move cattle into a part of the country and keep them there because they're only going to walk so far before they get, you know, I don't know if I'm going to find water before I need it, and they'll come back to that water source. So in arid enough, big enough environments, water alone without fences can keep them in certain parts of the landscape. So definitely an important tool. Um, herding, like I said, just kind of recapping. You know, herding is a, is a really important tool. You know, we found that, you know, folks, and these are primarily working on summer, summer type pastures, um, allotments, those kinds of things. They get out around 30 days a, a year out of a six month gra grazing season. At about 30 days a year, it kind of was a quadratic relationship. It kind of topped off. There wasn't any real benefit, but you know, you're looking at a month of herding. You ask what a month of a hired hands time costs. Twelve hundred, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars. You know, so you're looking at you're looking at that kind of money to implement a month's worth of herding, perhaps more. Um, so there's cost to that activity, but it's very effective. Um, one of the things that works well with herding, if you're in mountainous country, is you know you'll herd them over the hill into the next meadow. There's always a few that'll drift back on the trail, and a few cattle back onto that allotment onto that meadow can do a lot of damage if if you if you're not you don't know they're there and they stay there. So guys using drift fences, just little fences that block the trail. They walk up to it, they turn around, and they go back the other way. We found those to be really effective. And that, that's another old, old school trick to deal with livestock, particularly in a mountainous environment. Um, you know, since all this is based on visual assessments of, of health, we felt a bit vulnerable. We had not actually collected and measured anything that was, re it was tangible you know, from, from the sites. So we went back to a subset of these sites, about 60 out of this 130, went back to them. Another graduate student named Charlie Battaglia went back, and he collected um, stream insects. Macroinvertebrates collected them out of, the, out of the gravels, out of the substrate in the stream. And 
macroinvertebrate community composition is really telling about the quality of habitat in a stream. You know, you can have um, uh, macroinvertebrates that are very tolerant of pollution, and if your community is dominated by pollution tolerant species and the pollution intolerant species are not there, that tells you if something's wrong with that habitat. If it's dominated with species that are pollution intolerant, you know, if you're fly fishermen, caddis flies, stone flies, may flies, you know, helgramites, that kind of thing, um, if you've got dominated by those types of communities, that's telling you that conditions there are, are better. And so you take all kinds of metrics off of insect community um, data, just like you would off of plant community data if you're an ecologist or, or a botanist. And number of taxa, richness, is one of those variables. And we tend to want richness as a, as a, as a valuable thing. And that livestock distribution effort, just total effort, regardless of whether it's herding or off-site water or whatever the case may be, we just added those all up as days per, per year. And for different types of substrates, because different types of substrates have different capacities to support macroinvertebrate communities, gravels and cobbles you know, being primary habitat, Set, you know, stream reaches that are naturally fines or sediments tend to have less, just less overall habitat potential. But we see a real positive relationship there. So measuring a true metric of water quality and habitat quality, we find the same trend that we saw with observational estimates of health. So, so we're fairly confident in these, in these readings. Um, and it makes sense. And so, you know, just a simple graphic, just effort to, util effort to limit utilization and frequency, manage timing of, of, of grazing relative to, to seasonal vulnerabilities, leads to, in general, an increase in riparian health, measured by bank stability, access to floodplain, richness and diversity of habitat, macroinvertebrates, filtration capacity, et cetera. So these, these practices do work and I think the key thing is to set a target for utilization. And that target for utilization is going to depend upon the current status of that stream and the local conditions. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? I convinced you? All right. That's good. And yeah, there was a, there's a document out that's pretty good. I don't, how many are you aware of the SEEP project, Conservation Effective Effectiveness Assessment Program? I know the NRCS is for sure. You guys, were, you guys paid for it and we're a partner in it. So um, there's been several large literature reviews on the effectiveness of conservation practices in agriculture. So, you know, via the Farm Bill and EQIP and other cost share programs that I'm sure you're all aware of, substantial public dollars goes out the door. Um, on a cost share basis to agricultural and general agricultural landowners to implement practices, BMPs that'll prove all kinds of conservation objectives, one of which being water quality. There was a, a SEEP review of crop agriculture um, BMPs, such as conservation tillage and other things that was done about 08, 09. There was one done of pastures, irrigated pastures, eastern pastures, not, you know, tame pastures, not, not nat natural rangelands. Um, that was done about 2012. And there was one done for rangeland conservation practices. Uh, there were 40 authors involved in this. I think there's like 11 chapters. And um, Mel George, Randy Jackson, Chad Boyd, who's down with ARS and um, Burns, Oregon, myself, co-authored a literature review on the scientific assessment of the effectiveness of riparian management practices. And this entire document, all its chapters, is the most comprehensive literature review right now of how effective these practices are and under what circumstances. There's a chapter on seeding, crested wheatgrass, native grass seedings. There's a chapter on fire. There's a chapter on brush management. So I'd encourage if you want access to that to that information, you just Google Rangeland SEAP, C-E-A-P, and you can get access to all of that. If you want the one for crop agriculture, just crop SEAP, C-E-A-P, and they'll pop right up. You can get them all, they're publicly available. And you know, it's like I say, the, right now the best compilation of what we have. And one example of the kind of products that are in there, this is just a table based on a literature review that had been done back in 91. We brought it in. Grazing system compatibility with willow-dominated plant communities and riparian habitats and different grazing strategies and practices. And Elmore and et al.'s assessment 
at that time on their compatibility with willow recruitment and corridor fencing, which is of course complete exclusion, but riparian pasture, spring or early season grazing, winter grazing, you know, and I think the thing to point out here is that a good two thirds, if not more, of these possible strategies are compatible with willow recruitment. So there's, there's a lot of evidence out there that we can use various grazing strategies, including exclusion, but not limited to, to achieve these goals that we're looking for. So, so it's, a, it's a really great resource and it's free. Um, and so riparian fencing, exclusion is a big deal. Up here I know it's, it came up in many of the people's, your all's comments about what did you wanted to hear about. So I'll just put it out there and we can talk about it more afterwards. Um, when it comes down to riparian fencing, you know, there's riparian exclusion and corridors. Um, that's kind of an old split rail fence approach. There's exclusions and riparian pasture approaches. I think about it in terms of there's riparian pastures, which are intended to be grazed. They're generally larger than an exclosure. As John Buckhouse said, oftentimes you fence them so that the entire lowland is a part of it so that you're fencing along ecological lines. The uplands are fenced out from the lowlands, as an example. And then you manage those riparian pastures differently than you would manage the uplands. You manage them to achieve those riparian goals and annual targets that you've established. Um, and so those definitely can work. Um, exclusions. I think from the perspective of protecting water quality from livestock impacts, I think absolutely they can be effective. Um, there's no, no doubt about that. Um, management considerations that have to be taken into account are if, if defoliation is a component of managing weeds that might emerge in that ungrazed situation, um, weed, weeds and weed management could be an issue. Fuel accumulation during dry season can be an issue. Um, if the vegetation becomes decadent, its capacity to uptake nitrogen might be reduced. And so these are just things that have to be balanced on a site-by-site -site basis as trade-offs for whether or not you want complete exclusion or not. Um, I think it's, it's definitely a site-specific decision. It's also a decision where I've seen landowners, we were talking this morning at breakfast, I think, where I've seen landowners decide, you know what, I'm just going to exclude this creek and be done with it, where it just wasn't worth their time to, as they would say, fiddle around with this. You know, can we're just going to fence it out and manage the rest of it from an agricultural perspective. That covers my liability. I'm going to get money to pay for it. And that's the simplest thing for us to do. I've seen people make a decision based on that. It's just a fundamental time management decision for them and liability. So I think keeping an open mind that some folks are going to think about it that way. Um, others are absolutely adamantly against it. No way, no how do we take land out of agricultural production. And so I think there, it's, it's just, it's a very lightning rod management um, tool. And I think the key is just to keep that in mind and talk about it on an as needed site by site specific basis. Um, I think that's DOE's, as we talked this morning, that's your guys' thinking on it. So, so I agree with that. Um, it's just another tool in the toolbox. And there may be enough risk that it's absolutely required. I'll give you an example where I recommend it. We have a lot of drinking water reservoirs in California where there's grazing all around them. It doesn't make any sense to let cows have direct access to a drinking water reservoir that a million people are drinking from. Just doesn't make any sense at all. That's too much risk. You know, so fence that thing out and then figure out how to graze the rest of that area. Um, that's almost a, a no-brainer recommendation for us. If you've got, you know, only a half mile left of breeding habitat, spawning habitat for a species that's about to blink out and the risk of losing that habitat is too great, maybe that's a scenario where you need to fence. You know, so there are areas where the risk is simply so high that that is the practice you go to. But again, that's very site by site specific. That's, at least that's my perspective. Um, so some key points to take away from that. Uh, riparian enhancement must be a goal. Can't state that enough. If it's not a goal, it, it, it's just luck if you get there. Um, a grazing toolbox is required. There's not a silver magic bullet. Um, Site-specific adaptive grazing management is the key. Um, you'll know you've achieved that when you get there kind of thing. It's a journey to find the right grazing strategy for each stretch of reach, reach of stream. You know, it has to be, it just has to be logistically and economically feasible for the, for the landowner. 
It has to become part of their day-to-day -day management. It has to fit in to the overall operations that they've got to manage for on the ranch because they've got so many other important things to do. And so if it's, if it's too much of a burden, it's going to be difficult, even if they enter into it, for them to maintain it in the long run. And I think we can all appreciate that in all of our lives, right? We all wish we could say no a little more often and have a little less on our plate. And I think we have to come at it from that perspective. It's got to be doable. And then it's got to integrate with the larger ranch management plan. Um, you know, back to that question I always ask, so what role does this pasture play in your operation? And, and go from there and make it fit into that scheme or at least adjust the scheme so that it can accommodate what needs to be done on that particular parcel. Um, so, kind of switching gears into, you know, rangelands that can sequester microbial pollutants. It's a, it's a great story. Um, and so, thinking about just, okay, they've come out of, their, they've been excreted by whatever. They're in a pat, fecal pat of some sort. We've dealt with all the management problems that might be reducing the capacity of the environment to trap and kill these buggers. And so, we're finding that rangelands have an amazing capacity to attenuate microbial pollutants, and we want to work with that in our management. Um, let the landscape itself do the have heavy lifting. Um, and so thinking about fate of microbial pollutants on rangelands, um, I've always got a graphic. Might even call it a cartoon. You've got a cow pat raining on it, irrigating against it, stream flow, whatever the case may be. The questions are, the pat's there. Say it's got bacteria. Say it's got a pathogen in it. First question is, how long do they survive in the fecal pat, the soil, the water? John talked quite a bit about survival in water. I'm going to talk about survival in fecal pats. How long do they survive? And then, how are they released? How are they mobilized during rainfall runoff events or irrigation runoff events? What, what happens to them once they're out of the cow? Um, and we find some interesting things. They die pretty darn quickly under spring, summer, fall conditions, certainly in the rangelands that we're in down in California. And so this is, have any of you guys measured stream temperature with those little hobo or uh, onset temperature loggers? You know, yep, yeah. So we, we had a bunch of those because we did all kinds of stream, stream temperature research. And this crazy veterinarian I work with said, hey, I bet, I bet temperature's got something to do with deactivation of cryptosporidium. You know how we can measure temp temperature in a cow pad? I said, well, we could take these things and stick them, <laughs> stick them in a cow pad. And so we, we took cow pads, we mixed in the known pathogens, the amount that we wanted, crammed one of these $100 thermistors in it, put them out in a big array, out in the sun, some in the shade, and uh, summertime, wintertime, springtime, fall time, tracked air temperature at the site. Every, so long, every, every day harvested a subset of them, broke them open, figured out how many oocysts of cryptosporidium were in them that were alive. And we, when we put them all in, we knew they were alive. And so basically we're able to develop a curve based on the fecal pat temperature in Fahrenheit from 50 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, days until over 90% of the C. parvum that was in the cow pat. At lower temperatures, you know, a couple months they survived in there. You get up into the high 80s, low 90s, you get over 100 within a day, everything's dead. And so that's really cool. And what's really cool about this, you're like, well, wow, 104 is pretty hot. But think that's the temperature in the cow pat. Once the temperature in a cow fecal pat exceeds 104, all the C. parvum in the pat die within a matter of hours. Fecal pats in direct sun achieve 104 degrees Fahrenheit once air temperature reaches 78 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, they're solar loading, they're heating up. And so the mechanism for that is, remember, they're an egg, and their temperature, their hatching is temperature dependent, like so many eggs. And so they, once that fecal pat passed through the body temperature range of a host, me, you, a cat, a dog, whatever, those eggs hatched. And they hatched, and they're not in a GI tract, they're in a fecal matrix, and it's a hostile environment, and they die. So the, the crypto load that's being contributed out there on the landscape on a daily basis for that time period in spring through fall where you're at 78 degrees Fahrenheit and greater, which is every bloody day for us from about 
April 15th through sometimes even November 1st, down where we are. It's less up here, I realize. Basically, you're not accumulating risk. Every day, every couple days, the entire landscape of fecal pads, if there's crypto in them, are being autoclaved. They're basically being cleaned. And so your risk is only the last few days. It's not all the way back. It's not all the fecal pads that are out there. Does that make sense? So that's a huge finding for us um, and gives us a lot of capacity to think about timing of grazing. So if you're going to graze near, say, in a riparian pasture or near a, r a runoff area, you know, get out of there in mid-September. And you've got enough warm degree days between then and rainfall runoff that everything that's in that fecal pat, at least crypto-wise, is going to be dead. And so that can help you think about your timing of grazing proximate to runoff areas. Um, you don't want to have a lot of grazing if you've got crypto in the herd in cool season time where there's a lot of moisture because you're going to have a lot of survival. So just, just thinking about that decay as a mechanism and working with it and where and when cattle are relative to temperatures. E. coli decay. So this is fecal pat, same, same concept. E. coli decay in fecal pats, and this is on ir irrigated foothill pasture and on the Sierra Nevada front range. E. coli in the fecal pat, really high numbers, like I told you, they have a lot of it. One day after, two day after, three day after, plop, put it out there, it's fresh. Remember these bacteria can grow in the environment a little bit. And so they're in a fecal pad, it's moist, they've got nutrients. In the first day, we see a, a bit of growth within that fecal pad. But then that environment turns a bit unfriendly and we see dramatic decays in the number of E. coli within three to four days that are in that fecal pat. And we see a persistent survival out here. So there's a subset of the, of the population of E. coli that are able to survive under these conditions. And that makes perfect evolutionary sense, right, that you would have that. It's like you have a leading edge of a salmon run and you have a late edge of a salmon run. Those are good strategies to adapt to variation. And so that's exactly what these guys are doing. Um, and so huge decay. So this is irrigated pasture. So do I want to irrigate right now when they're in there? Do I want to irrigate one day after they're there? Or maybe I want to wait four or five days and irrigate that pasture after we've had some mortality. And in addition to having mortality, we've had some crusting of that fecal pat and some resistance to flow. That's a lot more intellectual thought to the cow pet than you probably thought ever happened, huh? You know, my mom and dad think I'm crazy. They spent all that money for me to go to school. I've got, I've got, more, I've got more years in college than you can imagine, and I'm studying the dynamics of a cow pet. Um, but, you know, all this stuff's coming together to definitely um, reduce risk substantially and give us management alternatives about timing of grazing, time of, of irrigation, um, and all those things relative to rainfall runoff, snow melt. Transport and attenuation, so that's all about it dying. It hadn't even got out of the pat yet, and it's dying like flies. Then we did these studies where we looked at out on range. This is what a lot of our range zones look like, annual grassland. Just think of it as, as, as wheat, wheat fields. We have annual wheat fields out there. And you put a fecal pad out there, get a winter's worth of rain, 20, 30 storms on it if you're lucky, and capture all the surface runoff that came from that fecal pad with a known amount of all those nasty bugs in it. Capture it, you know what you put out, you know what came off as runoff, you can do a mass balance and figure out what the attenuation was per, per yard of, of, of travel per meter. And what we found is with E. coli, Salmonella, Cryptosporidium parvum, you name it, about greater than 90% of those microbial pollutants are trapped within the fecal pat or within one foot of it. They just, they just don't make it anywhere. They get stuck in the pat or they're stuck in the soil, but they don't run off. Of the few percent that escape the pat, escape that first foot, and travel as overland flow, of that, of that component, we see an additional 70 to 99.9% .9 trapped per yard of flow. So if you start thinking about that, you know, for me to tip, that's a long way for a microbe. And this is after 20 storms have occurred. I mean, lots of flushing. This is not one storm event. This is an entire winter's worth of flushing. They can't, they just can't make it. And so we begin to understand why even though we've got huge levels of 
E. coli and fecal coliforms in cattle feces, we've got standards that we can meet oftentimes of 100 or 200 colony forming units because so much of it is either being killed or trapped on the landscape. You know, it's the direct contributions that can lead to really high flushes. But so much of our load is on the landscape, and so an important component of our management is distribution and getting as much of that manure distributed up out of the out of the riparian area as far as you can to let the entire grazed system, even though it's grazed, it's still acting as a filter. Thinking about wetlands as filters, you know, there's what you can trap out here on the pasture as it runs off, but then there's, this is the irrigated pasture, foothill irrigated pasture, University of California owns and operates down in, in the foothills. Irrigate this during the summer about every 10 days. Flood irrigate it, pretty good slope, you can tell. Generally, generally certainly conducts tailwater. Tailwater comes down, runs through this very small wetland. We sampled above and below two wetlands over about 18, oh, excuse me, 16 irrigation events. And one of the wetlands was intact and functioning. The other was somewhat channelized. And so we had a wetland that we were able to look at filtration efficiency on where the water came into it, spread out. There was no defined flow channel. We had another wetland where the water came into it and about, about 50 to 70% of the water stayed in the channel and didn't interact fully with this wetland. These were ungrazed wetlands in this case. Um, and this is a university property. I know at some point in the past, one of our field hands took a, took a backhoe and straightened that thing out, but none of them, none of them would admit it to me, but I know they did, um, which wasn't an uncommon pro pro uh, process, right, to drain, drain a boggy area. And so we looked at the efficiency of these two things over a series of irrigation events. And this is percent reduction. So this is the percent, if it's positive, that's how much of the um, E. coli sediment, et cetera, that came into the wetland that was retained. If it's negative, that means it was a net source. There was actually an increase. There was more generated. The blue is the functioning wetland. On average, 70% reduction of E. coli you know, 80% reduction in sediment. This is in tailwater, off irrigated pasture. Nitrate, John talked about that. Total N, total P, uh, soluble reactive P or orthophosphate. All reductions, substantial reductions. Functioning wetland was much more effective across the board than the channelized wetland. And the channelized wetland, because there was erosion in the channel, was actually a source of sediment. And so back to the benefits of functioning riparian areas to act as filters and be a part of your long-term strategy to improve water quality. Um, and so he's asking, how do you help convince ranchers? This kind of information does help. Um, having actual proof that the things you're suggesting can work and that these data were not generated from a runoff plot. They were generated from a, a wetland that is receiving runoff from a commercial scale irrigated pasture system. At least they know then the practice will work. Um, so kind of wrapping all that together into yet another graphic, kind of a funnel of funnel of death, funnel of, of, of retainment. 90% of pollutants are trapped in the fecal pat plus. For each additional yard, they've got a flow. You're looking at huge reductions. They do make it to a, a stream or a riparian area. You're looking at another 30 to 70% reduction and you get yourself down to very little risk just by having a hydrologically functional range landscape, which is a goal we all share. A hydrological function, hydrologically functioning landscape will produce more forage and run more cows. We know that to be the case. And it'll retain pollutants like crazy. We found similar findings since we had the infrastructure, worked with an environmental chemist, uh, various pharmaceuticals that are commonly used in range beef cattle, um, ana antibiotics, oxytexture, um, various antibiotics uh, we've tested, as well as some of the common um, growth hormones that you would use in, say, steers on rangelands if you're not in a natural program. And we found very similar findings trapped in a fecal pat or don't travel very far. And so a lot of these um, pollutants that we might be concerned about in urine and feces from livestock have very similar fates. There are different mechanisms probably that are causing it, but the outcome is essentially the same. 
So this, this kind of science about microbial fate and transport, you've got that bookmark there. We've got that microbial water quality information center. There's a whole section there about science. It kind of, you can see or recognize that stuff that covers a lot of what I've talked about. You can get to the papers that support, peer-reviewed peer -reviewed papers that support what I've been saying um, and, and access that information. Um, so so that, does that make sense? You guys believe that? You think that would work in, in Washington? You think some of those processes are occurring in Washington? I, I would think so. Okay, so yeah. um, kind of into wrapping up with management solutions and um, go from there. Um, so I showed you kind of the, oh, these are the things that create risk, risk. High stocking rates, livestock in critical hydrologic zones, wet season grazing management. Yeah, all those things can do bad things. There's no doubt about it. So understanding that they exist starts to tell us, well, what's the management that we can do to push back on that and create less risk? So thinking about the tools that we've got, prescribed grazing, cross fencing, offsite drinking water, Targeted supplemental feeding, riparian pastures, vegetative buffer strip, herding. It's the same set of tools we had to improve riparian areas. There's no other new tools out there. And so using those same tools to manage wet season grazing to, with a goal of distributing livestock to resilient soils and non-critical hydrologic zones in the landscape during saturated conditions. You know, when things are saturated, they're wet, stuff's running off, the, you know, the landscape is just bleeding water. Do everything you can to have those livestock on as a resilient a part of the ranch as possible during that time period. And I don't say that in they can't be on the ranch during the wet season. You know, some people take it to mean that. I mean, you can't put cattle on a shelf. I mean, they have to be somewhere. So just put them in the safest place you can find. I mean, I think that's a reasonable goal. Um, Hard to feed them on the shelf. Manage livestock distribution to offset their spatial overlap with critical hydrologic zones. Same thing, distribute grazing and waste across the landscape. Try not to accumulate it in any one place too much. Try to have it dispersed. Um, that's always good. That means they're grazing in a dispersed manner, which means they're making effective use of forage. Um, oh and actively manage grazing intensity in those critical hydrologic zones. You know, if you've got a riparian pasture, that sets you up for your capacity to manage not only grazing to promote vegetation and hydrologic function, it also gives you opportunities to determine when livestock material, fecal material will be there, and when you come out, and how long you give it to, to die, to become mortal, uh, to become inactivated. So the same tools exist. There's not a different toolbox to achieve these goals. They're very connected. And so, kind of along distributing livestock grazing, you know, remember we found that over 60% of cattle fecal load is near livestock attractants in summer, certainly in our landscape, which is pretty arid. Um, so we can position salt, feed, and water to attract cattle and any pathogens they might be excreting to safe areas, not near streams and in runoff areas. So back to don't put the salt lock in the riparian area. Put it, put it somewhere else. You know, it, it will... It seems so simple, it's extremely effective. You know, it's an easy thing to do. Um, and then moderate stocking rates, you know, all the things that John talked about, just setting stocking rate in balance with forage production is an absolute key. If your stocking rate's in balance with forage production, you're probably right where you need to be in terms of stocking rate to safeguard hydrologic function broadly across your uplands. Um, and set it in terms of site resiliency for negative livestock impacts to soil and vegetation. Basically, to stock moderately, which is a common recommendation that I think any range manager is going to provide to any, to any rancher. Um, and any rancher who's been in business for a while is probably moderately stocked. It's hard to stay in business if you're running out of feed every year, right? So creating your own little drought every year because you're overstocked, that's, expense. that's an expensive game. Hay is $300 a ton. You know, so those folks aren't going to be in business very long. So I think you'll find that a lot of our better operators are already at, at correct stocking rates or close to it. Um, and so just, you know, we know that as you increase grazing intensity, from no grazing to light to moderate to heavy, bulk density, which is bulk density increases, that's a measure of soil compaction 
as bulk density increases, infiltration decreases, and we know clearly that based on soil type, as we increase grazing intensity and, and hoof impact, we're going to see compaction. And at some point, it doesn't matter. If you're a sandy soil, you may not see any impact on infiltration until you get up into this level of bulk density. If you're a clay soil, you may start to see impacts to um, infiltration down at lower bulk densities. So this depends on soil texture and how resilient that soil is to compaction. It's going to compact it. The question is, at what point do you see an actual hydrologic outcome of that? And your soils folks can help you with that. They know those numbers uh, right off the top of their heads. And so anyway, this, this information, this stuff's well, all these rangeland stuff's available at that same website. I encourage you guys to share that, to go there, take a look. Talk to me, email if you have questions afterwards. Um, time to talk a little bit about irrigated pasture. About five, ten minutes. That of interest to you guys? Yeah? Okay. So I'll just talk about a, a sur so I talked about irrigated pasture and wetlands a bit already. So same kind of thing. We love doing these surveys on ranch. And so we, we had a program come on, a regulatory program come on board in California about 2004 called the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program. And basically it came out of a court case and developed a program by which um, under California state water code, you cannot discharge pollutants from your property without a permit or a conditional waiver. And that became enforced and it was very much focused on irrigated agriculture. And in my world, irrigated agriculture or folks irrigating pasture and meadow for livestock production. And we had not done a lot of work on, so what are the management practices on irrigated pasture that might be correlated or associated with water quality and tailwater, in particular looking at microbial pollutants. And so we have, it's real common in California, in northeastern California, central California, east side of the Sierra Nevada, from about Sacramento north, as they would say from Sacramento South, water's too damn expensive and rare to be growing grass for cows when you could grow almonds, you could grow grapes, you grow all kinds of other things. But in the north part of the state, there are very old water rights held by usually first water right holders up in the high country, privately owned meadows, where they put in old style diversions into dams, put water into a highline ditch to keep it up above, run it out around, run it out around, um, pastures and then out of that ditch, just old school, put a few rocks in the ditch and just turn water out and just wild flood irrigate um, these types of systems. Often you get tailwater and it goes back into the creek. So this is a real common flood irrigation system in California and they're within their water right to do it. Um, and it's been practiced, you know, a lot of these systems were put in late 1800s. And so divert, flood irrigate, return flow, and of course the questions are then what's the quality of that return flow and how is it impacting the stream that it's coming back to? And so we did a, we did a study with, a, with several cooperators, 10 of them, and a scenario like this where we'd have an irrigated pasture, and this is a real example on Ranch A, irrigated pasture, he had his diversion. We measure E. coli in the creek at his diversion, comes back, got water coming back off that pasture into that creek all along, all kinds of little rivulets running in. Sometimes there's a big tailwater coming back. Go down below all of his contributions, take another sample, do this over the course of the event. 52 to 1100, so huge impacts and increases. Cross under the property line, his water becomes his neighbor's water. He diverts it, what, what's in it now, tailwater included, at high levels. Irrigates his property with it, comes back. We sample below. The guy went from 52 to 1100. This guy went from 1100 to 1300. That's got to be management, right? And so what, is, what are some of the things that are creating that level of variation? And so same kind of idea. We started quizzing them about their management. What's your stocking rate? We measured their irrigation application, tailwater runoff rates, those kinds of things. And we found some real clear correlations. But first, uh, talk about these 10 streams and average below minus above E. coli. And so this is the difference. And so negative means it was, you'd lost E. coli, you'd actually had a sink. So the water went onto the pasture at a high level and came off at a much lower level. So we had three that were clear sinks over the course of the entire summer. Um, 
All three of these were um, fields that were actually being cut for hay and then grazed as aftermath. And so for much of the irrigations that had occurred, it was water being turned out basically into a great big buffer into a hay field. So hay fields, and I, I know that a lot of that happens here, hay fields can be really good sinks for a lot of these microbes. They're just a great big filter. Um, some of these were no, no change at all, and others with a complete, almost complete exact end of the spectrum, sinks versus sources, and so and those with no change. And so just doing some statistical analysis, correlating E. coli concentrations in runoff to their stocking rate or stocking density animal unit per acre. And we found an ex just watch the red one. And we saw an exponential relationship as you increased stock density. At some point you got out here and it really took off. And so, you know, we tend to recommend on irrigated pasture about a one to 1.2 animal unit per, ac per acre. That's about our recommendation from a production perspective in our part of the world. So down in here is what we're recommending for to allow some rest, to allow some recovery, to you know, and within rotation, that's about the stock density that we recommend. And folks that were well above that, you know, the cost of that in terms of water quality was an exponential cost. And so, you know, getting back down in here where we recommend gets you down, and this is tailwater, not even you know, gets you back down to within standard. And so there's there's a huge impact of stock density in these irrigated pastures. At least we found. Um, Decreasing runoff, tailwater runoff rate. As you increase tailwater runoff rate, more flushing, more water coming off, we saw an increase in concentration. There wasn't a dilution factor. There was m just more energy pushing more E. coli off of there. So in a lot of these kind of flood irrigated, 1875 designed irrigation systems, it's a little hard to manage your tailwater rate because you don't have a lot of management on your application rate. And so in some of these cases, the fix here to get down to less tailwater and fewer E. coli might be on the top end. Maybe we need to think about some gated pipe instead of open ditch flood irrigation. Maybe we need to control the onput of water more evenly across the field and in terms of, of amount so that we're not generating as much tailwater at the bottom. That has a lot of agricultural value because we can definitely improve forage production if we can get a better control and distribution of application at the top. Evenness and control of irrigation is the first key, right, to irrigation efficiency. And so maybe we ought to upgrade from 1875 delivery system to a 1965 delivery system. And, and that's the kinds of things. There's NRCS money. There's other cost shares available to help cover that. And you're asking about how do you get ranchers to adopt some of this stuff. It's easier for me in irrigated pasture, quite honestly, because pretty much every recommendation that I can make to improve water quality on irrigated pasture will improve productivity. So it's a great place to start. And you know you can, you can prove it in dollars and cents. Um, so then, just kind of summarizing irrigated pasture, reduce runoff rates, improve irrigation efficiency, uh, moderate stocking rates. You know, the whole idea of maybe allowing mortality and crusting, maybe rotating cattle out of pastures ahead of irrigation. The worst thing you can do is have cattle in the pasture while you're flood irrigating with water going under their feet, assuming there's discharge. Um, because, I mean, they're stomping around, they're stirring it up, you're going to get the highest levels if you have discharge while you're doing that. And then always, you know, work to minimize direct in-stream fecal and urine deposition if in that irrigated pasture they have direct access to the adjacent stream that you're irrigating out of. So, so that, that's kind of what I have. Um,